Hey everybody, Steve here, and today in this video we're going to be talking a little bit about God's Word. Uh, it's been a while since I posted one. <clears throat> a lot of stuff has been going on, and I got my little evening coffee thing going. But uh, I wanted to talk about some things, uh, specifically how there's a lot of things that we looked at and that we were taught and that we believed when it came to Christianity, American Christianity. And unfortunately, with American Christianity, it takes out a lot of the truth. Um, <clears throat> and you might be saying, whoa, wait a second, my church, the First Baptist Church, a Methodist, Foursquare, you know, non-denomination, whatever your, your church is, uh, I can guarantee you that there's probably some stuff in there that they don't address, that they don't like, things that they totally ignore. And uh, it could be something as simple as tithing, and you know you got to tithe the first ten percent of everything. But yet, when you look in the Old Testament, God never took away from His children. He actually, it was the tenth cow that passed under the shepherd's rod that would belong to the Lord. In other words, the first nine would provide for your family, and that what you gave after that, that ten percent was not. Uh, it, it wouldn't put you out. Your your children wouldn't go hungry. God never instituted a tithe to where it would impede upon uh, a man or a woman feeding his family. It wouldn't take away from the hungry mouths of the children, but I digress. Um, there's a lot, and there's a whole host of other things. A lot of these things are uh, the Sabbath, the feasts, uh, and all that has been done away with because for some reason we think that in American Christianity there's this new covenant, hence the old covenant has been done away with. The problem is when we look at God's word, we see things like words forever, everlasting, without end. Um, we see, when we go back to the Greek and the Hebrew, in the Hebrew we see olam, it says everlasting, eternal, uh, without end. It goes on forever. And so it's interesting that while we look at the Old Testament, we see things like the Sabbath. We see things like the festivals of the Lord in Unleavened Bread and Passover and, and some others, that these things were to be an everlasting way that we were supposed to observe and follow God. It's a commandment that he gave, a statute, a principle, but more overly is to generalize it, his ways are not our ways because our ways are steeped in sin, it's steeped in the flesh, it's steeped in the paganism of the time. Um, you know, in the beginning with Adam and Eve, God's ways were it. There was no other ways. And then when Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and they sinned, they were cast out. And that's when the enemy uh, came in. And all of a sudden there was these bumping of heads of God and, of course, the enemy, Satan or Hasatan, um, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, the bad guy. He's going to get his in the end. But what's interesting is that throughout time, the further we stray and the further we go from the beginning, the further away we split away from the truth of God's word. And we end up going off on a rabbit trail and off an exit that goes to the broad road that leads to destruction. Unfortunately, a lot of people have <clears throat> in Christianity, American Christianity is what I call it, uh, that that strays from the truth of God's word in different areas that people are ignorant either of the truth and the fact of what God's word says that for example the Sabbath is everlasting um, it's an everlasting covenant between his people and even in the Old Testament it talks about how the foreigners the Gentiles who follow God along with the Israelites and along with the Jews that they were the same law applied to them, the same principles, statutes, and things like that. And uh, so anyway, it ends up that, you know, there's just so many things that, i got a little computer thing going on here. Okay, we'll cancel that out. But uh, that what we see is there's so many things that, that the church leaves out in Christianity that when we actually look at these things and, and look at the definition of the word everlasting, eternal, forever, that we've done away with that here in the New Covenant, because we say we're New Covenant believers. But yet, it says that His ways are eternal. Hmm. His statutes, and, and so when He says that the Sabbath is eternal and things like that, you know, it's kind of interesting how it's forever. I just want to go over some scriptures, and, and basically, first let me go over some information uh, about the calendar, because it is Christmas time. 
We do have people that are putting out the Yule logs or setting up the Christmas tree. Jesus, old baby Jesus, was born on, on December 25th, and uh, unfortunately, he wasn't, okay? If you read the accounts in the Gospels of when Yeshua was born or Jesus, I like saying Yeshua because Yeshua means God's salvation. Jesus in Hispanic and in Spanish, uh, it means God's help. I'd rather have God's salvation than God's help. Uh, so in going back to his original name in the Hebrew, it's Yahashua or Yeshua. Uh, that's good. But it's like me going to Korea. If I end up going to Korea, people don't call me Scott. Uh, they call me Steve. But they say it. So I don't change my name or transliterate my name because I'm in a different country. And I don't think we should do that for, for God. And I don't think we should do that for Yeshua. Um, so anyway, but with the paganism that has come to pass, through the, the further we go from the garden, the more we get steeped in the paganism of the world. And that is become really evident in the church. Christmas trees, Easter, the whole nine yards. You know, even as a little kid, I, I never quite understood what Easter bunnies and uh, eggs had to do with Christianity or what God did. But there is no Easter bunny. Um, it, you know, it's kind of like, well, wait a second. And when I started studying those things, it seems that, wow, yeah, this stuff is not Christian. It is not biblical. Maybe that's a better term. And that none of these things are biblical but rather it's pagan in nature. <clears throat> Excuse me, paganism has crept in and we've just accepted it because that's what uh, our parents have been taught, their parents, their parents, their parents, and you go back generations and generations and hundreds of years back to the time of Constantine and you'll see that a lot of this stuff came about uh, with Constantine when he blended uh, paganism and those foreign gods that we're not supposed to have anything to do with and tried to blend that with the Hebrew faith or the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of bringing them together and having total control. Uh, and Constantine did a real good job at that. And even before that, there was this blending or this mixing of paganism and uh, Christianity, really, because Christianity is just following God in his ways, in a sense, and that, you know, back in the Old Testament, they were just waiting for the Messiah to show up. Now in the New Testament, he's shown up, he lived, he died, uh, his sacrifice was accepted by God, and so there is that completion. But the thing is, we still need to look at our ways. Um, or are they really our ways, or the ways of the world, the ways of paganism, or are they God's ways? It's interesting because if we look at the calendar, it, it seems that we forget that each day of the week is not... Uh, a Christian day, but actually the Gregorian calendar is a revision of the Julian calendar uh, for pagan and, and Roman Greek calendars and their gods and things like that. But it ends up that the ancient Greeks named the days of the week after the sun, the moon, and the five known planets, which is Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Uh, they themselves uh, associated with the gods of Ares, Hermes, Zeus, Aphrodite, Cronus, uh, respectively. So, for example, a lot of people will say, that Sunday is the day of rest. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Now, according to the Catholic Church, they changed the day from the Sabbath day uh, to Sunday, and they openly say that. Uh, you look at their writings, and they say that, you know, Saturday was the Sabbath, and we changed it, and that's now is the day of rest. Um, but Sunday, the word itself, Sunday, is dia solis, is the Sunday, which celebrates the sun god Ra, uh, Ra Helios, Apollo, Agmios, Mithros, or the sun goddess Phoebe. In the year 321 AD, Constantine ruled the first day of the week, the venerable day of the sun, and should be a day of rest. So in other words, when we see God in his testament, the original testament, uh, the Old Testament, which is interesting because didn't God in Jeremiah talk about, I will write my laws uh, in your hearts and your minds and that you'll obey them and then you'll be forgiven of your sin. And so his ways haven't been done away with. His commandments, his precepts, his statutes have not been done away with. So isn't it interesting that um, Constantine and even before that, that they changed the day of rest. Now if you look at early antiquity, you'll see that all of the early civilizations, Friday night to Saturday night, was the day of rest. And because the closer you get back to the beginning, the Garden of Eden, that Eden, that's what you see, is that God instituted that Sabbath day, um, Sunday being the first day. 
but it, it's interesting how paganism took parts of that, <coughs> took parts of the truth, and blended and mixed and came up with their own counterfeit thing. Uh, we look at Monday as Lune Dias, or the Moon Day. The Monday was the name of the honor of the Assyrian goddess Selene, Luna and Mani in Old English, Mon, uh, means day of the moon. Tuesday is Dies Martis, day of Mars. In Greek mythology, Ares was the god of war, renamed Mars by the Romans. In English, Tuesday comes from Tuia, the, the English Germanic god of war and of the sky, identified by the Nordic god called Tyre. Uh, Wednesday is Dies Mercurii, uh, day of Mercury. Mercury. Uh, the Greek mythology, Hermes was the god of trade and commerce. Hmm, pretty interesting. Uh, Mercury by the Romans. It ends up that Wednesday derives from the Scandinavian god Odin, the chief god of North mythology. Woden is the chief Anglo-Saxon Teutonic god, leader of the wild hunt. Thursday is really interesting because Thursday you have Dies Iovis, the day of Jupiter. In Greek mythology, Zeus was the god of the sky, renamed Jupiter by the Romans. Uh, the English word Thursday comes from the Middle English Thor's Day, referring to Thor, and uh, the Nordic counterpart is Jupiter. Uh, those gods there. Friday is Dies Veneris, the day of Venus. Uh, the Greek mythology, we look at Aphrodite, was the goddess of love and fertility, renamed Venus by the Romans. The name Friday comes from Freya, the name of the Norse god Odin's wife, and Teutonic goddess of love, beauty, and fertility. Saturday... Uh, Dias Attorney, Day of Saturn in Greek mythology, Cronus was the god of the harvest, uh, renamed Saturn by the Romans who ruled until dethroned by his son Zeus. So <clears throat> what we end up seeing is the days of the week, and if you even do some other research, you'll see that the months, uh, like January, is renamed after the god of doorway or on behalf of Janus. Uh, we see that uh, March is named after Mars, the god of war. April for Aphrodite. July on behalf of Julius Caesar. August for Augustus Caesar and so on. So what we end up seeing is that with this, we have really adopted the pagan ways. And when we start looking at the feasts like Christmas, Easter, uh, some other things, you'll see that, wait a second, we've really latched on and under the guise of saying, well, you know, this is what my family, this is what our country's done for, for generations. But unfortunately, that, those things are not God's ways. So when we look at God in his ways and we look at scripture, we actually see that, um, you know, are we supposed to be doing Christmas? Now, this is really hard because a lot of people say, oh, how can you deprive your, your child of, of such a happy time during Christmas? Really? Um, it doesn't matter. Happiness is not an indication. It's not a standard that God set um, because his ways are not our ways. If this was all about happiness, I'd be doing some stuff that is definitely against the commandments of God, and it, it's in direct conflict with Scripture. So that is not a valid argument. That is, that is only an excuse to not teach the truth of God and his word. Now, again, I'm not saying to do this as... as uh, to get down on anybody, but you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, am I saying that being obedient or disobedient to God is going to tear away your salvation? That's a whole nother video. That's a whole nother topic, and you need to decide. All we know is that when Yeshua, he said that many will say to me, you know, on that day, judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do all these things? And he's going to turn to you and say, I never knew you. Um, <clears throat> It, it's it's something to be said uh, to look up the word lawless, do word study on lawless, and you'll find out that those who are lawless are cast out of the city, uh, the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, and that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth to those who continue in sin, who uh, do their own thing and, and trample on the grace of God for an occasion of the flesh again and again and again, which Paul says, no, we're not supposed to do that. So um, that's kind of interesting. It's and, and with these things like Christmas, you know, you can say, well, we, you know, what I want it to mean is that's what's important. Mm, to that, I said the same thing. I, I said and believed the exact very same thing. And, uh, you know, it's, what, it's the meaning behind the thing and not the actual day. Okay, we all know that Christmas, you know, December 25th wasn't, wasn't when Jesus was born. Uh, 
Everybody knows that. And if you don't know that, remember when the shepherds, an angel came to the shepherds, they were tending their sheep, and they said, hey, there's the star. And, well, in the dead of winter of Israel, you don't have your sheep out in the mountains. It's dead cold. You have them inside. And if you look at and study and do research, you'll see that Yeshua was actually born sometime in the fall. Uh, and it's generally accepted as truth, except there's a lot of pastors out there, a lot of churches that do not teach that truth, and they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole because they don't want to come against your children having fun and you being a, you know, a stick in the mud when it comes to, whoa, wait a second. Isn't that kind of like what the Israelites did, how they took on the ways of the surrounding nations that God said, don't do those things? Because if you do those things that the nations do, those aren't my ways. And you'll be what? Will you be blessed for disobeying God or cursed for disobeying God? Of course, you're going to be cursed. But with that, there are some things that we need to look at in Scripture. Deuteronomy 8, 6 says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So automatically we see this. Some people will say, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. I don't have to worry about that. Unfortunately, the foreigners that followed God in the Old Testament that sojourned with the Israelites, uh, they fell under the same commandments, the same covenants, the same ways and statutes. So you need to be really careful. There is no difference between, it's like saying, okay, well, uh, the Israelites or the Hebrews or whatever you want to call them, those people back then that Moses led out of, out of Egypt and into Canaan and all that, well, they, that's, that's, that's old. We have a different law today. Really? Jeremiah says that God says, I will write my laws in your minds and your hearts, and I will forgive your sin no more. So in other words, it's not the external written code of us trying to say, well, I have to be saved. I have to complete these and do these many laws, uh, check the box, and I'm good. No, but he said that after being a new creation in Christ, that we are new creatures when we repent and confess our sins, that we're a new creature in Christ, and then we start obeying who? God. And we start doing the things of the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, and what we see in God's Word rather than what's in our flesh. Because in our hearts, our heart is deceitfully wicked. Uh, wickedness is bound up in the heart of the child. And if you're uh, just entering into the Christian faith, you really need to look at Scripture and see, search out the words that say forever, everlasting, uh, forever, uh, without end, uh, an eternal everlasting covenant. But uh, that's something else. To, that's another video. Um, but anyway, the same laws and the same ways and statutes apply to the Gentile believers as for the Jewish believers. Deuteronomy 26, 17 says, Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. So here we have ways, we have statutes, we have commandments, judgments. Uh, other translations will say, you know, principles or statutes. Uh, principles that God set forth. It's really, really interesting when you start studying, and I need to do more studying on this, but when we look at the ways of the world, the paganism and the backgrounds and the festivals that they had, um, compared to what we see in Christianity, the Bible, the whole counsel of God, Old and New Testaments, or witnesses, um, that's what it comes down to. Uh, we look at Deuteronomy 28.9, The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Now, some people say, well, that's, that's legalism. No, because we still see Paul in the New Testament talking about how we are supposed to, are we supposed to walk in the ways of the world? No. Are we supposed to go after the ways of the flesh? No, but we're supposed to walk in God's ways and be obedient and to not continue in sin because if we walk in our own ways or in the ways of the pagan, that leads to sin and sin leads to death. It will give fruit to bad fruit. Uh, so we need to remember that. We look at Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And it's like, wait a second, God's ways, our wicked ways, says he will forgive their sin. So automatically we're seeing evidence here in the Old Testament of things that God says he will forgive sin. Hmm. But that doesn't jive with what a lot of American Christianity puts out as saying, you know, well, the Old Testament it has nothing to do with the New Testament. Well, yes, it does, because Yeshua, he quoted the Old Testament. Uh, and even Paul said, you know, to the Pharisee, or Yeshua said to the, to the disciples, you know, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. 
do what they say, but not what they do. In other words, they were teaching Torah. They were teaching the Old Testament. And Yeshua is saying, hey, listen and obey. Don't do what they do because they're being hypocritical. Um, it's a, some really good stuff. Isaiah 58, 12 through 14 says, from those among you shall build the old waste places. You'll rise up foundations of many generations. You'll be called to repair the breach, the restorer of streets dwell in. Now here's the interesting part is, as we look at God's ways, his Sabbath. It says, if you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, <clears throat> wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, Jeremiah 18, 15 says, Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to worthless idols. We kind of do that on some holiday stuff. Yule logs and, and incense, and, and if you look back to the paganism of, of Christmas, and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways from the ancient past to walk in pathways and not on a highway. So, you know, it just ends up, it's like, it, it just gets worse and worse as you go on. To make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and shake their head because and I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Um, some pretty wild stuff. And what's interesting is when we look at our ways, we we really, really do need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That, and basically what that means is that we need to look at what we believe and hold dear in our heart that we put our hope and faith and trust in. And what gives us solace is it the ways of the world, which is steeped in paganism, or is it the ways of God, which might not be centered on happiness, but it's centered on the obedience. And the trade-off is that the way of the world might give happiness for a while. There might be that, that little bit of, ooh, that's fun, uh, because sin is a pleasure for a season. But God's ways, he gives peace that passes all understanding, and he gives joy. So our, our joy and our peace is not dependent upon a day or a festival, but rather it's dependent upon us following God and having that close relationship with him. So in my heart, the further and the closer I walk in his ways, the more he's in me and I in him. Yeshua talked about that. So anyway, I'm getting kind of all kinds of wild stuff here for the Internet is kind of wigging out on me. So anyway, it's really interesting on all these things. But in Revelation 15.3, it talks about, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, now this is in Revelation, includes Israelites and Hebrews and, and Gentile believers, and it says, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. So obviously we see that God's ways have not been done away with, as we see, and as some have, have preached uh, in our churches. Uh, Exodus comes out, you know, is uh, the feasts and the everlasting ordinances. Do we ever see a commandment in the Old Testament or the New Testament, for that matter, to take over Christmas and to Christianize it? Nope, we don't see it at all. Uh, do we ever see anything where it says we're supposed to overtake the pagan holidays and make them our own and, and have put our own meaning behind them or impose a Christian meaning behind them anywhere in the Old or the New Testament? No, we do not. So what we end up seeing is that there are some things that are supposed to be everlasting. We go to Exodus 12, verses 13 through 15, and it talks about Passover. Now the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and you see the blood I will pass over, and the plague will not be upon you uh, when I strike the land of Egypt. It's talking about Passover. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. In other words, that's another phrase, uh, a Hebrew phrase that means forever, uh, until he comes again, until the new heaven and the new earth. Um, you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So, And you'll even notice that some of these feasts are still carried on after the new heaven and the new earth. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you'll remove the leaven from your houses. Um, 
you go on, it says as an everlasting ordinance or a law, uh, something that the people who follow God and believe God will do forever while they're here on this earth. And it continues on afterwards. So really, what we have to ask ourselves at this time, God said forever, but he didn't really mean it. Is he schizophrenic? He changed his mind? No, uh, we don't see that at all. Exodus 12, verses 16 through 18, it talks about there shall be a holy convocation, that the feast of unleavened bread, for um, that no one shall work, will be prepared for you. Uh, for on the same day I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt, there for you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. The question is, if God set these things as everlasting ordinances, now you have to ask questions, is it just for the Jews and not for the Gentile Christians or Gentile believers? <coughs> Excuse me. And if so, where is that separation? <coughs> Excuse me, a lot of people say, well, that's the, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, that's not what Jeremiah says. When God told and said, I will write my laws, his Torah, his ways, his precepts, in our, on our minds and in our hearts, that we might do them as a new creature. Um, taking a little bit of that from, from the New Testament. So we really need to look at these things and say, you know, uh, is this something, is Christmas something that, you know, the happiness and the joyous times, are, are we really gaining joy from God, or are we trying to impose and, and gain a joy from a pagan day that God has never instituted or established as his days or his holy days or convocations or ways? Um, it, it's really interesting, and, and that brings to the point the Sabbath. You know, a lot of people say, well, the Sabbath's been done away with, or it's been changed. You know, we, we celebrate on Sunday. Uh, we worship on Sunday. Uh, so, you know, because that's when Jesus rose. Look at how the Jews uh, and how God, not just the Jews, and look at creation in Genesis, that the evening and the morning was the first day. And if you actually look at the Gregorian calendar and when Yeshua died, he was three days and three nights in the grave, right? So how many hours is that? Do the math. Then look at the calendar where he's, he's Friday, Saturday, and he rose Sunday morning. That's not three days and three nights. Ah, <laughs> so now, you know, now I can see some people are just like the gears are grinding and stopping and say, but, but pastor said, you know, the, 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 the person who went to cemetery school, I mean, seminary school, this is what he told me. This is what he was taught. And that's what he taught. And that's what the associate pastor taught me. And that's what, what everybody's been taught. Three days and three nights. How many hours? Look at the days. It's some really interesting stuff because of, again, God says in his word that our ways are not like his ways. And we need to get back to doing his ways uh, and observing his feasts. Now, you've got to do a lot of study. You've got to do a lot of prayer because during this time, you'll find out when you do some serious study and look at God's word. Don't look at what the pastor says. Don't look at what, uh, you know, the seminary and the Bible college professors say because, you know, we have to go by what scriptures say. And it's interesting that when we do that, we see these words of everlasting, forever, without end, uh, eternal, um, you know, the covenant, uh, the everlasting ordinance, you know, it, it, it never ends. And it's kind of the same thing with the Sabbath. We see a lot of things with the Sabbath it was in the Old Testament, and we also see it's in the New Testament as well, to where, um, <clears throat> I think it's Isaiah 66 or something like that, 56, 66, um, verses 22 to 24, where it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, and God says that all flesh, and it's not talking about just the Jews, but it's talking about all flesh, all of mankind that follow God, uh, will worship him from Sabbath to Sabbath and new moon festival to new moon festival, which is referring to the Jewish feasts that God, and they're not even Jewish feasts. Um, <clears throat> they're feasts that God set up, and the people that followed him the Jews and the Gersadiks, the, the Gentiles that follow God, they observe those feasts. So it's kind of a, a strange thing to say, well, they're Jewish feasts because the people that came out of Egypt were foreigners and the Jews, uh, the Israelites. Um, <clears throat> so we, we really need to look at the truth of God and his word. And the more that we separate ourselves away from the world 
and we start centering on God and His ways and being obedient to Him, His commands, His statutes, His ordinances, His principles, uh, we will be blessed in what we do. Um, it's, I know I'm going all over the map here. There's a, it's just shotgun blast everywhere. But I was recently talking with an individual who was very confused, um, saying, you know, I, I, I just don't understand why all these bad things are happening to me. And it's like, well, you know, what's the deal? Well, you know, I just don't understand. Then they, they label off a list of stuff that is directly in conflict with God's word, being disobedient, uh, being disobedient to other people within their lives. And next thing you know, it's just like, wow, I, I don't understand why, why this is happening. And it's like, well, any time that you sin and go against God, uh, whether it's sexual sin or stealing or lying or whatever the case is, uh, going against the commandments of God that is supposed to be written on our hearts, not, not on tablets of stone, but in the hearts of men as we are a living testament, a living example or messenger of God and his word, that if we go against what God has taught, it's going to reap what? Sin. What does the enemy do? Steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what sin is going to do in our, our lives. Ultimately, it's going to bring destruction. So if we uh, defile the marriage bed, guess what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to be a lot of bad stuff. And it would be idiotic to say, well, wait a second. I go out and I drink smoke and I cheat on my wife and I got caught and I don't understand what the problem is. I'm a good Christian. Really? Uh, have we, <clears throat> excuse me, have we strayed so far from God and his word that we have forgotten his ways and that we've ended up, we've, we're becoming a nation, we're coming a, becoming a people here in America that generally accepts that, you know, hey, whatever feels good, do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, I'm going to follow other gods or the god of money, the god of cars, and, and whatever, whatever else, the god of me, uh, rather than following, you know, the god, the almighty god, you know. Um, it's, it's just funny how we, things that used to be thought of as evil and bad and sinful is now these days is openly acceptable. We look in our society, even in some churches today, uh, there's Christian pastors that will say that homosexuality is wrong or is okay. They'll say that adultery is okay. They won't, they won't confront individuals that are committing adultery within their church. Uh, there's pastors that don't think that they commit adultery and they don't think it's wrong. Um, you know, um, you know, sex before marriage and sleeping around and, and it, oh, it doesn't matter. See, God set up this, this thing of cause and effect that if you sleep around, you'll get a sexually transmitted, transmitted disease. And the more people that do that, the more diseases abound. And so you are reaping what you sow. But instead, the ways of man have come up and they said, you know, well, hey, here's a pill. Take this pill. It'll cure you. You don't have to change your behavior because why? The enemy doesn't want you to change your behavior. Your enemy doesn't want you to change your heart and walk away from those lustful things of the flesh. Same thing goes for drugs and alcohol and the whole nine yards. You know, we get to the point of where uh, it, it's an affront to God. We're doing the ways of the nation. We, we're going back to those pagan ways of pharmacology, uh, of using those substances to have an altered state of consciousness and to bring us some peace or comfort or relief, when in fact God is the one who's supposed to give us that peace, comfort, and solace in our lives. We're supposed to turn to him for everything. Um, but people don't understand that. So we are saved by grace, first of all. Uh, there's a ton of mercy in there because God had mercy on had to have mercy on us first to send a Messiah, to send a Savior, because in spite of ourselves and our sin, uh, I don't understand how he does that, but there's a, a ton of grace, there's a ton of mercy, compassion, that he sent his son to die for us. And it's nothing that we have done. It's, it's not by works, but all by grace, by the grace of God, getting something that we don't deserve. Now as a new believer, we get to the point of where we were bought with a price. If you were going to prison because you couldn't pay a fine, and you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life, and we know what happens in prison. It's not fun. Um, but when that happens, and your judge is about to slam that gavel down, and all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, somebody says, hey, I'll pay the fine. I sold everything I had, a 401k, I was a multi-billionaire, I'm selling everything to pay the fine for you. How would you feel? Indebted, relieved, I'd be ashamed. 
uh, all at the same time, there would be that, that weight that would be lifted off my shoulders. And because that man gave up everything for me, I would be indebted to him. I would end up being his servant, his slave. And hey, whatever you want me to do, man, because there's nothing I can do to pay that back. He gave me freedom, and just as Yeshua gave us freedom from sin, liberty from obeying sin and going towards death, he took that sacrifice. He paid that price. He went down to get the captives that were in prison and set them free. So in that, when I acknowledge my sinful state, when I acknowledge that and I repent and I confess my sins, 1 John 1, 9, uh, he will wipe away all those things because of what he did on the cross and because he was resurrected. But it also says that I'm a new creature in Christ and behold, all the old th ways have passed away and behold, everything is new. That's Part of that is referring to instead of doing the world's ways, we're doing God's ways. Instead of doing what I think is right, it's what God's word says is right. And again, all you have to do is look at Paul um, and so many of the things uh, throughout the New Testament. Um, testament mean contract or witness, uh, testimony. Um, that's what our life should be. And if you don't read the beginning of the book and read through to the end of the book, you won't get the whole story. But unfortunately, in, in American Christianity, what we have is a lot of people studying a ton of the New Testament very little or none of the Old Testament, and if they do, they say, well, that's, that's for those Jews, Jewish people, the Jews, it has nothing to do with us Gentile believers. And you start looking at it, and words like forever and everlasting, eternal covenant with God and his people, which includes Gentile and Jewish believers together, we're starting to see that, wow. Uh, and what did, what did Yeshua said? Yeshua said there was two flocks. I've come for one, but there will be another, and they're all eventually going to be one flock. Wow. What, 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 what do we see in the New Testament? That God came first for the Jew, and because they rejected it, he went to the Gentile. You know, Paul talked about it, for the Jew first, then the Gentile. Uh, and in, in that God accepted us as believers, he forgave our sins. And that hopefully in doing that, that his people, the Jews, would become jealous. And that would drive them to the faith to repent and to follow the Messiah. So it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff to take in. And I know I've, it's like 37 minutes, almost 38 minutes of talking on this stuff. There's so much. It's like drinking from a fire hose. It's like, ah, and what you're going to see and what you're, some of these things is going to be in front to you. And you're going to be like, oh, that's not what I was taught. That's not what, you know, blah, 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 pastor so-and-so said. Get the scriptures out and do the research for yourself. Pray and ask God to open your eyes and your heart to his ways and his truth and not the truth of that guy, that guy, or that guy over there, or this Bible college or that seminary, or this uh, television prophet evangelist or this one internet TV dude, um, me included. Look and test everything. Look at God's word. Do a search on forever. Do uh, studies on the Sabbath, the feast, and see is there a time where we've ever had, where God has ever done away with those things? Hmm, pretty interesting. What you'll find is that you won't see that in Scripture. God doesn't say, okay, here are all these feasts to do forever, and okay, well, eh, stop. You don't have to do them now. No. But what we see is through the rebelliousness of Israel, through the rebelliousness of the Gentile believers, uh, American Christianity, we feel that there's a lot of things that we do not have to do. And that's, that's not what we're supposed to do. But we see that we've paganized, and Constantine had a lot to do with this, is that the followers of God ended up going into those pagan ways to try to blend in and mix so they wouldn't be persecuted, so they could hide. But God doesn't call us to hide. He doesn't call us to hide before enemies. He calls us to not be afraid. That's actually a commandment in God's word, to not be afraid of the enemy. And as soon as you let doubt in, as soon as you start fearing uh, the enemy or fearing others around you for what you believe, you're not going to walk out that belief. And you're going to fall short. And that's not what we're supposed to do. So anyway, I know this is an extremely long video, but I just wanted to go over some of this information because I haven't made a video in a long time, and, and there's just so much stuff that's going on. Um, 
look at the traditions of Christmas and the Yule time logs and all that stuff and pertain to killing your babies and throwing them on the fire and wow yeah I really want to celebrate that you know look at the look at the symbolism look at uh, uh, the origins of Christmas and Easter and, and don't don't come off and say you know as I did and say you know well well I just you know I believe in God Easter is about the resurrection really when you go back to the origin it's not so you know it kind of depends um, just do what you can look at, at, at what is going on go back to scripture and see what it says test everything test the spirits test the message test the word look at it in context in the whole counsel of God and ask importantly for God's wisdom and his truth the spirit of truth the Holy Spirit to make to reveal these things to you to open your eyes up to the truth instead of the lies of the enemy which is based in paganism and the ways of the world too easy <laughs> I only wish it was um, so anyway, that's what's going on. I just wanted to, to kind of drop this bomb of truth on you on this soon-to-be Christmas holiday season. But when you really look at it and you really start looking at our lives, how much of our lives do we really turn over to God uh, to follow? Um, only you can answer that. Only I can answer that. You know, we need to work out our salvation, work out our beliefs to make sure that it stands on the truth, the foundation of God's Word, that rock of Yeshua, or the shifting sand of the world, kind of like that ending that was going to be. So uh, just remember, it's a lot to look at. Take care, God bless, and hopefully we'll see you on the next video.